Hi again, welcome to our journey through the Psalms. We're up to Psalm number 25. It seems unbelievable that we're up to 25 already. And I hope you've been enjoying it. Um, if you've stumbled across us as you're surfing on the internet and found us and decide to stay here, really welcome. We're Dublin Vineyard, a community of followers of Jesus who are experiencing community and his transformation online because of the coronavirus thing. But if you stay to the end, which I'd love you to do, it actually might change your mind about Jesus and you might find that actually a life learning from him is the opportunity of a lifetime. So today is Psalm number 25, but what I want to do is just tell you what we're going to do today because it'll be a little bit different. It's a little bit more scaled back because with what's happening over Easter weekend, which I will tell you in a minute, um, we're scaling back a little bit on the worship and the prayer. So we'll have uh, worship, but it will be the reading of the Psalm and we will have our devotional and our time of silence. So that's what we'll do today. What I want to do is I want to tell you about what's happening over Easter weekend, which we're really, really excited about. So we have three things happening. The first thing is happening on Good Friday tomorrow at 8 p.m. And what we're doing is we're organizing an individual retreat for everyone. We're going to provide you with the material so everyone is retreating with Jesus using the same material for 15 minutes at 8 p.m. on Friday. Now, just find a quiet place in your house or in your apartment. It might be you have to get into the uh, toilet to do that. But and just spend if you have 15 minutes, if you've more, great. But we would do all that together at 8 p.m. on Friday, Good Friday, tomorrow. Then on Saturday, something we're really excited about is that Vineyard Churches UK and Ireland are going to be live streaming a video called Legacy, which was a video made back in, recorded back last July of the original founders of the Vineyard, Carol Wimber, the wife of John Wimber, John who's now died, and Bob and Penny Fulton. And they're talking about how the vineyard started, how the Lord started the vineyard. And it's really, really powerful and encouraging for us as a vineyard movement. And so I want to encourage you at 8 p.m. on Easter Saturday evening to tune into that live streaming. And it's really interesting because at the end, Carol Wimber gives what she senses as a word from the Lord. She gave it last July, and it's really applicable for the time that we're going through right now. So the second thing that we're doing is on the Easter Saturday, the live streaming of the legacy out of uh, Vineyard Churches UK and Ireland. And then I'm really, I can't wait for Easter Sunday. Christ is risen, and we're going to have our Easter Sunday service at 11 o'clock. We'll be doing it, video streaming it online at 11 o'clock Easter Sunday morning. So please join us. And what we'll do is we'll put links up to all these things onto our very social media platforms. But just encourage you, just as a community, that we would engage in these together on the Friday 8 p.m., Saturday 8 p.m., and Sunday morning at 11 a.m. to celebrate the risen Lord and us as a community doing that. So that's kind of like our announcement for today and explaining what we're going to do today. And now what I'd like to do is actually transition into worship. And as worship, we're going to read Psalm 25 together. Now, in Revelation chapter one, verse three, it says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this. So I'm going to be blessed because I'm going to be reading it aloud. And blessed are those who hear it. So you're going to be blessed because you're hearing it and take to heart what is written in it. And that's what we want to do. We want to take to heart what is written in it. And throughout millennia, God's people, God's church have engaged in worship through the public reading of his word. So that's what we're doing. So let's worship by reading and hearing and taking to heart Psalm 25. This is the word of the Lord. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame. 
nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame, but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Saviour, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. For the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Who then is the man that fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way chosen for him. He will spend his days in prosperity, and his descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have multiplied. Free me from my anguish. Look upon my affliction and my distress and take away all my sins. See how my enemies have increased and how fiercely they hate me. Guard my life and rescue me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness protect me, because my hope is in you. Redeem Israel, O God, from all their troubles. This is the word of the Lord. I really like this psalm. It's a psalm that's a prayer, but it's really real. Like the psalmist, he's not in a good place. It's kind of like his whole life is falling apart. And it's got so bad, he can't hold it together. He can't even pretend to hold it together. He's kind of just collapsed. If he's around today, we'd probably say that he's going through a psychological and or spiritual breakdown. The way he's living has just been overwhelmed. And he's falling apart in so many ways. Firstly, he's living under a cloud of shame. In verse 2 and in verse 20, he talks about, let me not be put to shame. Shame is a really big deal for everyone. It's devastating to the wholeness and wellness of the person. And it's a deep, deep wound. And that wound has happened or is about to happen to him. We don't know in the psalm who the enemies are, but they have the power to shame David. So he's shamed or hopes to avoid it, but is feeling it already. And shame is kind of like a poison to people. Shame is that thing that tells you you're not good enough. You're not smart enough or clever enough or good looking enough or popular enough. You're just not enough. That's what shame is. So David is carrying shame, but he's also carrying guilt. In verse 7, he talks about the guilt he's feeling for the things that he's done. He says, do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. He's asking God not to remember them, but David remembers them. They're still very real for David. They have destructive power over David. Now, they might either be sins of his youth that still, that he committed long, long time ago, that still haunt and accuse him. Or they could be long-standing sins, sins that have been a pattern in his life since his youth, and they continue to have power over him. But either way, David is burdened by them. So David is carrying this huge burden of sin and it's crushing him. In verse 11, he calls his sin great. And if that's not bad enough, he's 
carrying uh, this burden of sin. He's overwhelmed with shame, but he's also lonely and afflicted. He's in anguish. The troubles of his heart have multiplied. And the King James Version uses the word desolate. He is in a really bad place. Not unlike the way Paul describes himself in 2 Corinthians when he says, battles without and terrors within. You know, sometimes life just comes apart at the seams. You can't hold it together anymore. You can't control what's going on. You can't pretend anymore. You're basically, you've collapsed. And that's what's happened to David. Maybe a way to describe it would be you don't even have the energy to keep on the mask that you wear in front of people, in front of yourself, in front of God. You just don't have the energy for that. And it can feel really dark and hopeless. You feel like you're at the end of your rope. But you know what's so weird? That can be a really good place to be. Dallas Willard says, God's address is at the end of your rope. Sometimes God has to allow you to get to the end of your rope, to fall apart, sometimes literally, so that you can begin to learn to live life his way and get life from him. Because falling apart is a falling apart of how you think life should go. It's a falling apart of how you understand life should work. It's a falling apart of you being in control of life. And what that does is it brings you to a place of surrender and surrender is key. You see, you let go of all your expectations, all the ways you look for significance and worth and identity and value and acceptance. And you come to Jesus empty handed, hurting but relieved, feeling beaten and beaten up and tired of trying to make life work but glad to be able to stop even if you're not sure what's next. You're at the end of your rope and that's where you find God. That's what David did. From that place, David discovers God and in discovering God, he finds a remedy for everything that's broken and wrong in his life. God has a new way of doing life for David. God has a new way of doing life for us and it's the opportunity of a lifetime. So what does David discover? Well, in verse two, he tells us, no one who hopes in you, God, will ever be put to shame. God has a remedy for shame. And remember, shame is that poison that tells you there's something wrong with you. Not that you've done something wrong, but there's something wrong with you. You're not good enough, smart enough, funny enough, popular enough. You're just not enough. And shame is really destructive. And in the hands of Satan, he will use it to destroy our souls. But David has found a God. David has found a God who says, David, you're enough. Not by what you do or by your successes, by simply being who you are the person I made you to be. You see, you can never be put to shame if you live from the place that you know you're fearfully and wonderfully made. If God's original design for you is unique and wonderful and you know that, then you can't live from a place of shame. So letting God tell you who you are, letting him give you your worth and identity is the key to freedom from shame. And it's part of this new way of doing life that David is encountering. It's letting God give you your identity and your worth and your significance and acceptance. Remember, the voice that you listen to on the inside creates the reality that you're living in. Allow God's voice to speak inside you, telling you who you are. That will create a, the reality that you live from. And that's a great place to live from what God tells, uh, says about you. But you know what, in a sense, David had to get to a place of breakdown, of having nothing in his hands as he entered God's presence. 
nothing that he might use to show he had done something that he was worthy of God's acceptance. You see, so long as you want to or need to point to something to show your worth or value to God, you can never completely experience the blessing of grace, of simply being who you are, the person God originally designed. Because part of the boundless riches of Christ that is available to us is to understand we need not walk under the burden of shame because of who God is and who he has made us to be. And that's where the two sides, he talks about humility, the two sides of humility come in. Because humility is crucial in this. In verse 9 he tells us, only the humble can learn from God to live this way. Because it takes humility to come with nothing in your hands. Nothing to commend us. And from that place to humbly accept that God has made us valuable. Included us in his family through what Christ has done for us and restore to us our original design and birthright as his children, loved even as Jesus is loved. Of value simply because we're his children. Only the humble can learn that. And then God has an answer for David's guilt, not just his shame. Because it's, verse 8 tells us it's out of his goodness and uprightness that God will instruct sinners in his ways. You see, God is the type of God who forgives sinners for his name's sake, verse 11 tells us. And what that means is that God's hanging around with us doesn't sully his name. Actually, it displays the type of God he is. It's to his glory that he hangs out with you, that he forgives you your long-standing sins. Think about that. What are your long-standing sins? Those things that just don't ever seem to go away. Or the stuff that you remember from long ago that still haunts you and you're ashamed of. God forgiving you, hanging out with you, displays who God is. It displays his glory to hang around with you and forgive you. We don't make Jesus dirty, so to speak, by hanging around with him. He makes us clean by us hanging around with him. And that displays his glory. Forgiveness displays the glory of God. Forgiveness of you displays the glory of God. So enjoy forgiveness. It's part of learning to live life God's way. I just want to say that again because I think it's really important. Enjoy forgiveness because it's part of learning to live life God's way. Can you see what David's being invited into? What God is inviting David into? A new way of living, a whole new way of living. It's what Romans 6 calls newness of life, or the message translates, new life in a new land. And it's the opportunity of a lifetime. You see, this God of David wants to lead David and us into life, what Jesus calls life to the full. And so he wants to teach us the way, his way, into that life of living life, which is life to the full. Like if you think about it, which seems more like life to the full? A life characterized by shame or one characterized by condemnation? A life characterized by bitterness or one characterized by kindness? A heart that holds on to unforgiveness or a heart that forgives? A life of meanness or a life of generosity? A heart that believes the worst of others or a heart that believes the best of others? This type of life of no condemnation, of kindness, of forgiveness, of generosity, of mercy, of believing the best of others. That is what God is inviting David into. And it's what we're being invited into. And it's the meaning behind the repeated use of the word way or ways in the psalm. Like in verse 10, all the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful. And God is inviting David into his ways of living life. And so David wants to enter into this apprenticeship with God, where he will hang around with God, being taught by God how to live life to the full. And this is the very thing that Jesus invites his followers into, his apprentices or disciples. And he invites them in the very same way, being with Jesus, learning to be like Jesus. But God doesn't stop there with David. 
You see, God heals David's loneliness by being David's friend. God brings David into his friendship. Verse 14 can be translated, the friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. And he makes his covenant known to them. We are never alone. The Lord calls us his friends. He will never forsake us or abandon us. And as for the troubles and afflictions that have multiplied, what David will find is that the Lord is his refuge, he tells us. You know, this kind of breakdown, where you come to the end of your rope, it happens to many of us who follow Jesus. And I think we see it in Peter's interaction with Jesus in Galilee after the resurrection in John chapter 21. Jesus, Peter has denied Jesus publicly three times. He's deeply ashamed. He did what he thought he could never do. He thought he was a better man than that. And so after the denial of Jesus, he was a broken man at the end of his rope. And that was where Jesus found him. And he found Jesus. God's address is the end of our rope. And what happens is, up in Galilee, is Jesus asks Peter three times, do you love me? And Peter replies twice. But the third time Jesus asks, Peter's hurt because Jesus feels the need to ask three times. And Peter says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And I think what Peter's saying here is, Lord, I have learned that I'm not the man, the kind of man that I thought I was. But you've always known the kind of man that I am. That is the man who stands before you now. And that man humbly says, I love you. And then Jesus calls Peter to follow him, to be with him, to be with Jesus, so he can learn to be like Jesus. That same invitation is for us. You see, this psalm tells us there's a new way of living available to us, a way of goodness and love, and it's the opportunity of a lifetime. And we enter in this, into this new way of living of, by bringing our lives, every situation, every day, into the kingdom of God, under the dominion of Jesus, where what Jesus wants done gets done. And I think Matthew eleven twenty-eight and 29 in the message captures all what this psalm points to. And this is Jesus speaking. Are you tired, worn out? Doesn't that describe David? Are you tired, worn out? Come to me, says Jesus. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you learn to live freely and lightly. Matthew 11, 28 and 29. The opportunity of a lifetime. You know, you may or may not be at the end of your rope, but the invitation is to us all. There is a new way of living life. And the only way to experience it is to become Jesus' apprentice, to be with Jesus, learning to be like him. And you may be listening because you stumbled across this video streaming and may have learned something new today about Jesus. And you might be interested to know more. And if you are, if you go to our website, dublinvineyard.ie, or email our office, office at dublinvineyard.ie, we can point you to some resources that will help you take the next step on your spiritual journey. And you know what, as I was preparing, I felt some of us listening to this devotional on Psalm 29, that, or Psalm 25, that Psalm 25 would articulate where you are right now on your spiritual journey and identify your next step. And where you are is that you know Jesus is inviting you to a more complete surrender of your life to him, to live life his way, and you realize that you're actually resisting it a little bit or maybe not actively pursuing it because you have to actively pursue and this is an opportunity to take that next step on your spiritual journey, that next step of a deeper surrender. For you to tell Jesus you surrender, 
that you want to enter more fully into learning to do life his way. And I felt for others that you actually today, as you're listening and as we're sitting and afterwards we'll have a little time of silence, that you would actually enjoy forgiveness. Forgiveness is to be enjoyed, not simply believed. That actually it would be a physical sensation. I feel like for some of us today we will enjoy forgiveness. And then that the lonely would know his friendship and the desolate and afflict, afflicted his refuge. And for some of you who are feeling, and maybe it's taking you by surprise, almost terror in the midst of this coronavirus thing, that you would know the refuge of God himself. So right now, what I'd like us to do is enter in a time of silence, but a little bit different because I want it to be a ministry time. So I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit to come and minister to you. For those of you that need to surrender, that those of you who need to enjoy forgiveness, those of you who need to experience friendship, those of you who need to experience refuge, that it would happen right now. So I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit to come and minister. I want to encourage you, if you like, spiritually and mentally lean into what the Holy Spirit is doing. Just lean into what the Holy Spirit is doing. You don't have to do anything other than that. You can just sit there, maybe have your hands open, resting on your knees, just as a sign of openness. Maybe close your eyes just to avoid distractions. And let's welcome the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to pray, and at the end, I'll, I'll close this part. Come, Holy Spirit. Come in power. Jesus, you fill everything in every way. Now fill this space. Fill this silence. Move in hearts to enjoy forgiveness. To embrace surrender. To find refuge in the storms and friendship and loneliness in you. More of your power and presence, Holy Spirit, right now. Father, with the authority you've given me, I speak enjoyment of forgiveness over our community. I speak surrender, embracing of surrender over our community. Friendship with you, refuge in you. I ask for more of your power now, Holy Spirit, at work in us all. what you're doing Father and just as you sit there I want to read again Matthew 11 to you are you tired worn out burned out on religion come to me says Jesus Get away with me and you'll recover life. I'll show you how to take real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you learn to live freely and lightly. 
this is the opportunity of a lifetime. Amen. So, we're about to come to the end of our time together. But before we do, just a reminder about our Easter schedule. Tomorrow, Good Friday, 8 p.m., a 15-minute personal retreat. The resource for that is going to be on the, all our social media platforms. And I'll also email it to you through Church Suite. And it's just together we pray through at home by ourselves the same uh, material directing our hearts and minds towards Jesus on Good Friday. And then Easter Saturday, 8 p.m. again, Friday 8 p.m., Saturday 8 p.m., the live streaming of the Legacy video from Vineyard Churches UK and Ireland. And I think it could be all across the world live streaming. It's really a great video, recorded last July and quite um, profound in light of everything that we're going through now. And then on Sunday, for me the highlight, video streaming our Easter service, 11 a.m., 11 a.m. It's going to be packed. The place is going to be jammed. So can I encourage you? Now, our Easter service on, on the 11th is going to be online as well. Um, so it'll, the internet will be jammed. But can I encourage you this weekend to engage in all three community events? Friday night, 8 p.m., personal retreat. Saturday night, 8 p.m., Vineyard Legacy online. Sunday morning, Easter Sunday morning, 11 a.m., our Easter Sunday service. And I have to end with this. Christos en este. Aletos en este. God bless, guys. <laughs>